and welcome to our math series for teachers in the FET phase and of course everyone else who's interested in education in the country. Let's take a look at our video. When a rocket blasts off into space, its position is changing all the time. This rate of change of position relative to time is called velocity. Velocity is established by differentiating the distance function with respect to time. It is also the slope of the distance time curve. Calculus is used in two main ways. Firstly, to sketch curves of complicated functions like cubics, and secondly, to determine the maximum or minimum values for real quantities, like for instance, the maximum height of a ball thrown upwards. The intended outcomes for this lesson are using calculus to sketch graphs, solving problems involving rates of change, and finding a maximum or minimum value of a quantity. I think up to now, we know what... The first activities are designed to develop the skill of sketching curves using calculus. Calculus tells us about the slope of the curve at different points. Look at activity number one. In this activity, learners will look at linear, quadratic and cubic functions. Just go through this introduction. Drawing graphs of functions can be made simpler by using the rules of calculus. In other words, calculus can help you to sketch any graph. What other methods did you learn in sketching graphs? We find the y-intercepts and the x-intercepts. Can anyone quickly come and draw the Cartesian plane on the board for us? I always use them to explain to, to, the, to the class. I, I, I do like that method where they go up there in the board and illustrate something. That is also another strategy that I use. The teacher first revises the concept of the Cartesian plane. This is just an algebraic equation that you must present here in terms of a graph. So whatever you draw on the Cartesian plane represent the, that equation. Right. Now, in that equation, we've got a number of variables. We've got m, we've got x. We've got the teacher first defines linear functions and their equation. He gets the learners to define the terms of the equation. I think c is very crucial because it gives us the y-intercepts where the graph is going to pass through the y-axis. Any point on the y-axis is the y-intercept. And any point on the x-axis is the, stands for the x-intercept. Do you understand that? Yes. So what do we know about the point on the y-axis? Let's say I've got A, which represents point A. What information do I know about point A? X is equal to zero. For every y-intercept point, x is equal to zero. When differentiating a linear function, you get f dashed of x is equal to m times 1 times x to the power of 0 equals m. This implies that the slope is constant and therefore that the line is straight. On a graph like this, there are no turning points and no minimum or maximum points. So now let's look at activity 1.1a and look at the function f of x is equal to 2 into 2x plus 3. Just see if you can sketch the function. Do you understand that? In this example, the learners have to determine the derivative of the function, the x-intercept, the y-intercept, and the slope at the x and y-intercepts. They also have to make a rough sketch on an axis like this one. Or we divided by, we divided 6 by 4. Then you get 1, negative 1 and a half. Okay, so this is the x intercept. Okay, thanks. The teacher now goes through the example with the class. We all got the same answer, is that right? Yes. Who got something different from 4x plus 6? No one. 
4x plus 3. So this means, because f stands for, represents any function, this function is in terms of x, so which also represents y equals to 4x plus 6. So if we say linear function, we mean a function which is in the form of a, a line. So how do we get a line? We simply have to join two points. By just joining two points, we do get a, a line. Now if you look at the, your solution, your linear equation, which is y equals to 4x plus 6, what can you say about this 4? 4 represents the gradient of the function. What is the gradient of the function? We mean the slope of the We mean the, the, the slope of the function. The gradient of the function is the slope of the function. So the linear function that we got is y equals to 4x plus 6. In a linear function, the slope is constant. There are no turning points and no minimum or maximum points. Given the value for y as 4x plus 6, the x-intercept will be minus 1.5 and the y-intercept will be 6. Because the slope of a linear function is constant, it will have the same value at both intercepts, in this case, 4. Okay, let's all look at x, uh, activity 1.2. The slope of a quadratic function can also be found by differentiating the function. This gives the result f dashed of x equals 2ax plus b. The learners are given the quadratic function f of x equals 4x squared plus 12x plus 7 and have to determine the derivative of the function, the x and y coordinates of the turning point, the y-intercept, the slope at the y-intercept, and the point symmetrical to the y-intercept. They also have to make a sketch of the curve. The teacher assists those that are experiencing problems. Let's say you have f of x equals 2x two, two cubed plus 4x. What will be the slope of this function? It's, it's 6x squared plus 4x. Plus, what do we do with the gradient? Now just do that. Let the gradient be zero and solve for x here and see what you get. Whole activity down to sketching. Let's summarize this now. So if you look at the shape of that quadratic function up there, how is the shape of the function? It faces up, so it means... The teacher now summarizes quadratic functions and highlights important aspects. How is the nature of A if the graph faces up? Positive. So if the graph faces up, the A is positive. As you all know, that the gradient of the function is the slope of a function. We derive the function in order for us to get the, the slope of the function. How did you derive this one? The derivative is 2ax plus b. This derivative is the gradient of that function. Do you get that? Now, in our shape there, how many turning points do we have on this shape? We've got one turning point. We have one turning point. What, do we, what type of turning point is that one? It's a minimum turning point. It's a minimum turning point. A minimum turning point is when the A value is positive. Do you get that? Now, if the A value is negative, what type of a turning point is that one? We have a maximum turning point. And the shape of the graph? It faces downward. The graph faces downward. Now, how did they get the axis of symmetry from this a function? How did they get the AOS? At the derivative equal to zero. The axis of symmetry occurs at the turning point where the slope is zero as it changes from negative to positive. At this point, f dashed of x equals 2ax plus b equals zero, and therefore, 
x equals minus b over 2a. In grade 11, we just told you that the x value of the turning point is minus b over 2a. Now, using calculus, you can discover that. The slope of a cubic function can be found by differentiating the function in exactly the same way. The function is quadratic and changes direction twice. There are two roots and two points where the slope equals zero. In other words, two turning points. So at point A, we have a maximum turning point, and at point B, minimum, minimum turning point. Now, how is the gradient of the function at point A? The slope is zero. The slope of the function is zero. Key features of cubic functions are, the curve can have up to three roots, so it can cross the axis up to three times. It can have up to two turning points. The slope between the turning points will be opposite to the slope on either side of the turning points. The cubic term will dominate, so if the coefficient of the cubic term is positive, the slope will be mostly positive with a negative kink between the turning points. If the coefficient is negative, the curve will be mostly negative with a positive kink. The sign of the coefficient of x squared determines whether f of x is a minimum or a maximum. I think that in calculus the difficult part is also in... I think they don't understand deriving the function. Now the problem starts why do we have to derive the function. That is the difficult thing. After deriving the function, what's next? then it becomes a problem there. So they, we should also emphasize that we derive in order to see the maximum or the minimum turning point of a function. Calculus is widely used to work out minimum and maximum quantities in real life situations. This activity will show the learners how this is done when a can is designed to hold a specific volume of a drink. The learners are given the following situation. A new cool drink company is offering high energy drinks for the young market. They plan to sell their product in three different quantities. Mini Boost in a 250 milliliter can, Medi Boost in a 500 milliliter can, and Maxi Boost in a one liter can. Assuming that the basic design of a can is a cylinder, learners have to determine the radius and the height of each can so that the company will use the minimum quantity or area of aluminium. To solve this problem, the learners will need to differentiate the formula for surface area to determine the radius that gives a minimum area, equate the differential expressions to zero and solve for r. They can then find the second derivative of the expression. If it is negative, it will be a minimum turning point. If positive, it will be a maximum turning point. They don't want to spend more. They want to use a list. So that's why they decided to do that. The learners first need to get the formulas ready for differentiation. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. So for example, in the case of the 250 milliliter mini boost can, the volume of the cylinder equals pi r squared h equals 250. Therefore, h equals 250 over pi r. A can is a cylinder. This is the formula for the surface area of the can, including the top and bottom circles. Therefore, for the 250 milliliter mini boost can, we get Learners now have to differentiate to find a minimum value for the area of the can. Using the 250 milliliter mini boost can as an example again, If we now differentiate, we will get the turning point will be where the derivative is equal to zero. This is the point where the minimum amount of aluminium will be used for a given volume of the can. In the case of mini boost, this will be where the radius of the can is 3.41 centimeters and the height is 6.83 centimeters. So now it is just the summary of all this. We use calculus to sketch the function. We use calculus to find the minimum or the maximum.
We've seen our video. Now it's time for us to welcome our guests. Today we've got Tasca Matlejwane from Pafokhang Secondary School, Catherine Hunter, who's an independent maths consultant, and Smangali Sotwala, who's also an independent maths mm -hmm. consultant. Thank you for joining us. The first question, let me start with you, Tasca. Do you think it was a useful approach to move learners from linear through to quadratic to cubic functions? Yeah, I would say for connectivity purposes, it's good to go through all the graphs that way. But I still maintain it's much more useful if it's a revision lesson because it might be too bulky for learners to do at the same time all the functions. But the good part of it is that they see some similarities through from linear right down to or up to quadratic equations. On that score, I would feel this was well handled. And one other thing that which I liked about it is to show actually to say uh, through all those graphs, there's a common outcome that which was uh, you know, uh, broadly put. And that to me, I think it was a driving force to know that at the end of the lesson, learners should be knowing ABC. That was good. Sma, would you agree with what Tuskis just said? Yes, I would agree with what he said. Um, I think it was a useful thing to do. Um, though um, uh, there wasn't enough a, a written work given to the children. I would actually add that maybe after finishing a particular a section or function that the, the learners work on that a bit and then see the differences uh, and the similarities as he puts it. So do linear and do some questions on that, yes, quadratic do. questions on that and then, and then move and then move on. cubic. Yes. Okay, Catherine, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, th I think that the teacher was assuming quite a lot of knowledge on the part of the learners, and I think he did consolidate it and revise it well as well. But certainly learners would need to be able to compare and contrast those three different kinds of graphs um, and have adequate practice in, in being able to see what the characteristics of them are. Um, because he, the teacher is assuming that, that that's a very solid information, and it's not always clear. Some learners really do struggle to see what is the difference between them um, and what are the maximum and minimum points and so on. But I think that in, on the whole the teacher did give a fair um, good diagrams for example on the diagram on the board that would have consolidated that knowledge. Talking about the board, what do you think of the teacher's chalk and talk approach? And again, uh, what about the teacher's use of questioning? The chances are that in this particular video we only saw the teacher at the board and that he in fact did give the learners more practice in between. That's what I suspect because certainly there is a danger that a teacher can stand and take on the role, do the work for the learners, and they must watch and the teacher can assume that the learners have in fact absorbed the information themselves, understood it and would be able to do the problems on their own. Of course no teacher can do that. I, I would agree with Smagaliso that you need to do it in small bites, give them practice in between and the, I think that this teacher probably did do that. The learners did refer to a worksheet that gave them some calculations to do. They had to differentiate different graphs, find the maximum and minimum points and so on. And the teacher did ask um, good questions, ask the, the learners to unpack those equations and say, those functions rather, and, and say what, uh, what can we, how can we use that information to help us draw the graph? How can we help use that information to find the gradients at different points and so on? So I think um, in general the teacher was, did um, use a good questioning approach and set a good example. Okay, Tasca? Yeah, I like the way he used the chalkboard and also because he invited learners also to, to be part of the, uh, the, the lesson in terms of coming forward <coughs> excuse me, and using the chalkboard as well. Uh, that I think it brings about freedom amongst learners. That the chalkboard is not clearly defined as the teacher's domain mm -hmm. and therefore the chalkboard was properly utilized. And secondly, I would say that the, the, the usage of questioning was also well done, as particularly when it comes to groups. Uh, doing question at group level so that a small group of people will understand uh, through the questions that which were raised within that. I quite concur with the teacher, he did it very well. Okay, Smangaliza? Mm. Yeah, uh, with regards to chalk and talk, um, I think he, 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 he was actually quite good with that, although there were a little bit of some problem. In the beginning, he was actually using the children to come onto the board and do something. I think it's one boy or so. 
But later on, the children were not coming too much to the board. He was actually using the chalkboard for summar summarizing uh, uh, things that they have agreed upon as a, as a class. So I would say maybe he, he's, he's okay when using the chalkboard, but maybe more of learners would also be, it would be also be nicer if they could use that. In terms of uh, questioning, um, the use of questioning, um, I, I like the way he asks questions. Mm -hmm. He does ask questions um, that uh, actually sort of make the children think and just not routine questions. Um, learners are supposed to say why they say things are like that and so on. So I think he's on the right track. And the example of the can, was it a good example, do you think, to show the, uh, the value of calculus? Yeah, that was a very good example. Um, a can, it's one of the things that uh, learners know a lot about. Uh, uh, the cool drinks and so on comes from those cans. And um, they have actually done this um, uh, uh, this lesson in a way, the, the finding of surface areas in the previous classes. And so they, there's a connection uh, between what they have been doing in the past years and what they are doing now. So this was actually a nice um, example of, I mean, yeah, a good example for the learners to use. Okay, Catherine? I thought it was a wonderful example. It could have been enhanced by um, showing us on the video the exact graph that the learners could have constructed were they to look at different sizes of can, for example. Um, and I think that may have, again, left a, a powerful impression. They were given three different sizes of can and they had to, in a way, correlate the, because they had to see how much aluminum, what was the minimum amount of aluminum that would be used to construct the can to a certain volume. And it would have been interesting for learners to actually demonstrate on a graph how the volume increases with the amount of aluminum or whatever, just to explore that relationship more clearly and relate it to differentiation more boldly. As it was, they did it in a quite a fairly cold way. So I think that much as it was a very good example, it wasn't taken maximum advantage of in this particular case. A lot can be done with it, a lot more. Okay. Yeah, Jessica? I quite concur with that. I, I think it, it was not maximally used, that opportunity of a can. Like, for instance, if you could have stuck to one, maybe one little example, maybe of 500 mils, and to, to start to explore the relationship uh, favorably broadly, where they would draw and come up with different uh, measurements and see the same amount of material but given different volumes, that would be more exciting. Okay, any other comments? Yeah, I, I would say so sometimes I'm bothered by the way we say things as educators. The language sometimes can put some children off. Like for instance, in the examples as we are going through them, starting from linear to uh, quadratic, showing the minimum and the maximum. And there was a tendency of going to the cube, where you have the minimum and the maximum, whereas that is the local minimum and the local maximum. And the minute you, you stop saying the local, the local minima and the local maxima, mm -hmm. uh, learners tend to think that it's one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And also the elaboration of saying, why is it a local minimum? Mm -hmm. Why is it a local maximum? Okay. Because the, 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 the quadratics and the cubes are not exactly the same. Causes confusion then to learners if, you're not, uh, if it's not stated mm -hmm. clearly. Exactly. Well, that's it for this session. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for watching. Do keep your eyes peeled for our next module coming up soon. Mm -hmm.